reception cocktails that will uh, happen a bit later at half past five. And the first uh, talk today is Stefan uh, Denman. And he will be talking about OSSC and configuration aware links between LM and PLM. So it's like a very hot topic that we've been yes. talking about a lot in the last years. So uh, uh -huh. Stefan, the floor is yours. Thanks. So uh, just a, a quick bit of background about my background with this topic. Uh, I was most, I, I'm a freelance consultant now, and this is one of the things I'm focusing on. Uh, I was most recently with IBM up until uh, near the end of last year, the IBM group that has the continuous engineering offering, so all the, the, the rational tools, if you will, um, the Jazz, the CLM, Rhapsody, Doors, those things, right? Um, and when I joined IBM four years before that, I came from PTC. And if you add just that the PTC and the IBM time together, that's seven years that I was focused almost entirely on integrating uh, ALM inclusive of systems engineering, okay, um, with PLM. Tried it at PTC, you know, so, so, so far that I noticed that IBM seemed to be making some moves that direction. Okay, thank you for the heads up there. Uh, seemed to be making some moves that direction, so I hopped on over to IBM. Um, we made some progress, um, but they, I, yeah, they, we made some progress, but I left late last year to start uh, my own consulting firm and just dive right into this um, head first, uh, in the shallow end of the pool, no less. <laughs> so um, that's, this is one of the things I'm focusing on a lot now. What I've discovered is um, this is not a trivial problem. ALM and PLM uh, have very different configuration management models. Uh, I'm using the word model here because I want to <coughs> convey just exactly how different they are. Okay, We're not just talking about having different names for the same set of concepts. If you fly over this domain as if it's, you know, a continent or something at 100,000 feet, it's easy to look at ALM and PLM systems and say, they do the same thing. The names are changed just to protect the guilty, right? But in the end, uh, they both do configuration management of ad lifecycle assets, you know, so why don't we just get rid of one of them and use the other one as the system of record for everything, right? Um, I've been around a few of those epic failures. Um, but none of which I can actually name. <laughs> um, Non-disclosure agreements and embarrassment and all. Um, and it's not until you really start to fly at a lower altitude that you begin to see that, uh, that fundamentally these two things are different. One of these things is not like the other. And this, I believe, uh, and I've been around this, by the way, for 35 years. Um, my first attempt to deal with this problem um, was almost 35 years ago when I started working on a computer integrated manufacturing project, a huge program for the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, and the idea was take 10, 11 um, contractor operated laboratories, design institutions, uh, and, um, and production agencies, manufacturing, um, and get all of their engineering data moving back and forth smoothly, uh, and so on. It was a billion dollar a year program, um, and I don't think we got very far. Um, this was before anybody had even coined the phrase product data management, much less PLM, okay? ALM wasn't anywhere near. Um, you know, a thought in anyone's head. But that's what we were doing. And so I, having been around this for about 35 years, I've, I've learned a few things, and one of them is that these two are very different. And one of them has to do with the fact that the configuration model of software is, I, I'm gonna use the word static. What I mean is if we um, define a baseline, a baseline being, I'm pointing to, for this file, I'm pointing to this version on this branch. And I, and I actually um, take, you know, cut that baseline, if you will, 
and it, you know, pointing to version, the, the right version of each other file on the right branch and so on. Once I've cut that baseline, it's done. Um, I can go back to it if I need to. I can roll back, I can rebuild the software off of that baseline if I need to, uh, and so on, right? Okay, so, it's, so uh, in that sense, when I, that's what I mean when I say static, okay. In PLM, it does not work that way. I can't say this enough, okay? Um, hardware configuration management is a little bit more dynamically evaluated, okay? It's a little more rules driven. And this is exactly at the center of the problem for how we OSLCers are going to make a way <laughs> to use OSLC to point back and forth at things in these two very different systems. Another big difference, right? Number, size, type, change of frequency of the assets, right? Source code, thousands and thousands, sometimes tens, hundreds of thousands of small files, textually oriented, able to be merged because they are textually oriented. Uh, what are we managing the typical product data management platform? Big, monstrous, CAD files that rarely ever change, at least where the PDM system is concerned. What I mean by that is, sure, there, there may be continuous change going on in a given CAD file. How often is it getting checked back in to the PLM or PDM tool? Well, I mean, what's your frequency if anybody has, uh, is familiar with your PDM side of the house? Um, once a week? Probably not, okay? Whereas on the software side of the house, shoot, I, I mean, I'm a software developer. Minutes. Yeah, minutes. Um, that's before we started doing something called DevOps. Uh, it's, it, they're just radically different. So my point that I'm going to make here is that these, these challenges remain. Uh, I think too many people, and especially at management levels, um, with you know, some of the largest firms out there in almost every industry that do complex products are assuming, because they're flying at 100,000 feet over the terrain, that it's all the same. And oh my god, it could not possibly be different. Uh, so here's my point here is that most of the current ALM PLM integrations, and when I say most, there aren't many. So, you know, two of the three current ALM PLM integrations, not really, but there are very few, they're not configuration aware. By that I mean, they don't really address this problem. They copy assets back and forth. Uh, they establish relationships from the copy to the, you know, think of data synchronization. And, um, um, but the, here's the problem. Right there, there's the problem, okay? And so we lose information as we go forward. Um, <laughs> errors resolving traceability across the systems. Now here's where, I'm an electrical engineer by training, um, but here's where my software background comes in. I like to think of that as undef. Anybody familiar with that data type? Okay. Let's do a quick thing about uh, PLM and how this works on the PLM side. I'm assuming everyone here has some degree of knowledge of how, that's, how this works for software development, uh, but, I, but I felt I could not assume that everyone here was familiar with PLM systems. So on the PLM side, we have something called the Bill of Materials. This is the fundamental configuration, product definition, configuration management uh, structure on the, in the PLM system. It is hierarchical only. Why? Because a physical system is hierarchical by nature. You cannot reuse a part. <laughs> it doesn't, this can't be done. A real part can't be reused, okay? You make one, you put it in there, you can't take it out and move it over there, okay? And even if you could, it'd be missing from there. You have to make two if you need one here and one there, right? Okay, so by definition, right? Now, second point to make here, revision control, okay? So I got, um, I, had a, uh, an, I had a product, I had a, uh, an assembly, a high level assembly, right? That's a bunch of parts that you put together into something that becomes a subcomponent of the overall product. And then maybe I got a sub assembly under there. 
and then maybe that subassembly is made up of three different parts that have to be assembled and they have to be put together in a certain way and so on. Um, every single one of these nodes in the bomb can be revisioned. Good. And they are sequentially revisioned. Ah, see, I told you, it's just like software. There's no <laughs> difference. Um, and so, uh, as we revise, as we rev and release a revision of the part, we, in the bomb, we, we get a new instance of the part. Yeah, and the first was rev A, and the second one is rev B. There may be versions in between those, okay, but every time there's a major release point, you're gonna get a new rev. That's just pretty much the standard model. So I'll focus on the revs, okay? Uh, here's an interesting thing about this hierarchy. And some PLM systems, arguably most, will enforce this rule. If you rev this, this has to rev. I just got a whole new revision of my assembly. Do we do this in software? No. We don't have to. They do. Okay, if anything in this assembly changes, if any form, fit, or function within the assembly changes, within one of the parts in it, the assembly must rev. So, so the, the top two would also have to be updated, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for being my straight man. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's what. Sorry, I, I mean, I I'm a PLM vendor. Yeah. And we do not. You don't do that. Doing that. <laughs> Let's talk. <laughs> uh, Unfortunately, but, but I know too many right. that do. People yeah. are doing that, and that's. <laughs> The age-old assumption, because it's all about hardware, is if you rev something, and, and that, and first of all, you, well, I'm sorry, if you rev something or create a new part number because of form fit function change, down the tree somewhere, sort of the general assumption is everything about it has to rev because the, the all the way up to the product because it's a different product now. That, okay, in practice, that doesn't work. And, okay, people go to great lengths to avoid having to do this. And if you saw what, uh, what people will do to how parts are hanging around in the bond structure to avoid this rev rule, so they don't have to rev the damn product every time they rev some minor part 37 levels deep, um, you'd be stunned. In the software world, we wouldn't tolerate it. But they, uh, I'm not saying that people in the hardware world are sloppy by any means, what I'm saying is this is what their tool is enforcing on them or their process and their tool, yeah? I, had, I saw a hand up. Yes, sir. Um, so I think actually in the software world, we sometimes do this. Uh, and there are sometimes very good reasons for that. Uh -huh. So if you have a mono repo, basically that's what uh, Microsoft or Google have, or all your software is not split across thousands more repos, but it's one mm -hmm. tree. Uh, the benefit for that could be because you can exactly reuse components in other uh, portions. You can hit a problem known as a diamond dependency problem, mm -hmm. where two parts of the same program at the higher level depend on two different versions of the software module, which causes undefined behavior in many cases. Yeah, and in fact, uh, um, I think that the, what you're describing is something called version skew. Um, at least that's often how it's that, yeah, exactly. related to. Yeah. Sombra has its own configuration management challenges by virtue of the fact that it is fundamentally reusable. But as I said before, physical parts are not fundamentally reusable at all. Um, and so hence we sort of operate on this assumption that if you change the form, fit, or function of a part that's 37 levels deep in this hierarchy, everything above it runs. Okay, um, <clears throat> so that's that. But now let's talk about something else, serialization. Here's where we get to the physical world. Yes, sir. But you're not talking up here about variants, right? Uh, uh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. uh, because you say it's not reusable, that's why I asked. But yeah. Sorry. yeah, absolutely. Uh, serialization, okay. Serialization, the idea behind this is when I go to build this thing, when I go to the factory floor, if I'm in a serial production environment, by that I simply mean that I make you know, quite a few of these things, and so I, each one gets a, a unique serial number as I make it, okay? Um, so that's why I go to light blue here. So it's part three rev B, and I just manufactured serial number one of it, and I stamp one on it, yeah? Um, 
and then I make the second unit, I stamp two on that one, I make the third unit stamp three. It's still part three, rev B, right? Um, and then um, we, we go and do this, this thing called effectivity, okay? And this is quite unique to the physical product world and not at all to software, period, okay? I rev the part, something changes about the part. So it gets a new rev, it's released now, which means it's going to affect manufacturing. It's also gonna affect service and operations, but we'll get to that. Let's just stay focused on manufacturing at this point. I have just made serial numbers one, two, and three. Yeah, then I create part three rev C. Um, but you can't just do that. You can't go into the engineering, the, the design bomb and say, Ah, it's changed. Okay, the, the manufacturing people will lose their minds as they as well they should. Yeah? Well which serial number would you like that new part to be to, to start what would you like us to start putting that new version of the part in? Which serial number? So an engineer gets asked this question and he or she goes into the PLM system and writes this rule on serial <coughs> number greater than or equal to six. So we're, we haven't even built four and five yet in the factory. As we build four and five, we need to be careful to use the rev B of that part. <coughs> and then, only starting with, with serial number six of our product, shall we begin to use rev C of that part. Now, this, this, this is where things get fun, right? So here we go. Uh, we continue on on the factory floor. We make serial number four still on rev B, serial number five still on rev B, Finally, we use Rev C on serial number six and beyond, right? Seven, serial number seven would be Rev C, yeah? Okay, there, to, uh, to the straight man who said, what, but what about variants? Okay, well, imagine that we have a product and it has two variants, two, two, uh, two product variants. We've got variant A and we've got variant B. How's that realized <coughs> in the bomb? Well, by marking the parts that need to vary to define that variant this with, with things like variant A and B. What I'm not showing here is uh, this looks very static. The way I showed, especially if you're a software developer, you're gonna look at this and think, all right, so I go through the bomb, and for an, uh, for an automobile, there could be a million nodes in the bomb, yeah? Um, and everywhere some part or assembly should vary to, to make A or B, I'm going to encode, I'm gonna create a new part, uh, or two new parts, one for A, one for B. It's not how it works. Uh, in point of fact, it's, it's, uh, you can do that. And for major variation, sometimes that is the right thing to do. Um, or you can write rules. If, if product variant A, then do this at this at this point in, in the hierarchy. If product variant B, then do this. If product variant C, there, this part doesn't even happen. It doesn't go into it. Okay. <clears throat> and now let's make it more complex because gosh darn it, if it's not more complex, we don't have jobs, right? So, but this bomb, this bomb actually had, there's, there are versions of this bomb spread across the product life cycle. Let's imagine that for the most part, what we were just talking about was the as designed bomb. Okay, but once this is released, it re it's released to where? Ah, manufacturing, where we have another, oh, I'm sorry, there's our variants, okay, where we have another bomb. It's called the as built. In reality, by the way, I'll just go ahead and tell you, there could be two or three other bombs in between these two. Um, but, but simplifying it, as built. Okay, by the way, I don't show it here, but the as built bomb, or as planned actually, um, may not have exactly the same structure. Because the way the engineer thinks of the product going together is not the way the manufacturing engineer thinks of the product going together. They have to worry about things like you can't drill that hole right now. If you drill that hole in that part right now, um, you are going to create a void or you're gonna do something bad, right? No, instead, you must machine that part this way, then you can drill the hole, then you can come back and machine further, then, okay? 
And that, has, I'm not even saying anything about assembly procedures, okay? I mean, they're going to think about how can they make this, how can we put this car together fast, right? So they're going to parallelize some of those assemblies and they're going to get, anyway, the point of the matter is, this will A, grow, it will have more nodes in it, and B, it won't even look the same as this. Roughly the same, fly over at 100,000 feet, not so much the same as you get down to about 50,000 feet, right? Um, now, here's where the effectivity, at least that particular effectivity type of rule, the serial number effectivity rule, would come into play. So I'm making, I, I was merging two things together earlier as I talked about those, but in point of fact, that kind of serial number effect, there are no serial numbers here, okay? Um, the, but there may be over here a rule written by an engineer that says, if serial number six or greater, greater than or equal to six, switch to rev C. Yeah? And then um, the way the manufacturing process planner uh, puts this in the manufacturing bomb, that's a whole nother kettle of fish. Okay? And then once we make it and put it out there and somebody starts using it, uh, hey, it's going to change again because parts are going to fail. And we're going to replace them with new parts. Are the new parts that we replace them with going to be perfectly identical to the parts that were installed in it in the factory? Not only no, okay, we need to keep track of that, at least if it's complex enough, okay? Think of airplanes, okay? We track every aircraft in the world by tail number, individual tail number, and every one of them has a bomb that goes with it. So what, what, what once was a single bomb for that aircraft model and series and so on became one-to-one, um, -one, it, it became a manufacturing bomb, and then as each one is cranked off the line, a copy of that manufacturing bomb is made. Okay, there, and then, oh, I forgot to mention, two or three more bombs in between here and here. Isn't this messy? So, on top of that, we've got this thing about traceability across these bombs. This is not a very good representation. In point of fact, um, very few of the lines are going to go straight across. In point of fact, here's a, a small example of it, right? This was uh, variant, uh, part three, variant B, right? And over here for part three, variant B, we, had, we have all of those serial numbered versions of it, and it's traceable to that. But of course, then we rev to C after serial number six, and this gets a little complicated, okay? And then over here, what happens, right? We start replacing parts after the thing gets in the field, and that complicates those traceability relationships. Okay, so we think of cross life cycle traceability all the time, right? But when we talk about cross life cycle traceability in the software and systems world, and requirements and <coughs> those kinds of things, it looks a little different to them. Okay? Now, here's the software configuration management file. Source code goes into files. Files have versions. Ah, it's all the same. See, I told you, it's all the same. Oops, we realize variance with branches. Now, that's not the only way to do it, right? Uh, but that said, well, frequently, right, product variance, we create branches. These are permanent branches. These are not work branches. They're permanent. Then we branch work off of these branches. We just like to, you know, we like to branch and branch. Okay, so, um, and then we, uh, to, to um, define a product release, we make a baseline. Baseline points to not only a specific version, it points to the correct branch and then the correct version on that branch. So here's variant A at release 100, and it's pointing to variant A1, and here's variant B at release 101, and it's pointing to here. Probably 100 at variant B pointed to here. Okay? Um, now let's, um, let's quickly jump out of that and look at the OSLC config management spec. And, um, as, and I've reordered this from Boyd, it appears on the page, but uh, for a reason. Um, so here, let's look at four of the um, conceptual things. There are concept resource. Well, yeah, sure, that, we know what a concept resource is on the software side, right? It's that file, okay? Uh, I mean, if you're down at the SC, you know, software configuration management level, is there such a thing as con uh, concept resource in, in most people? Yeah, right, parts, documents, files, even change management things like engineering change uh, requests, change orders, change notices, and so on. 
um, could be considered concept resources. Versioned resources. Well, not everything in PLM is versioned. Just like not everything in software is versioned. Okay, perfect case in point, change management, typically not versioned. I've seen systems that do, but typically not. Um, same thing in software, we typically don't version an issue or a change request, right? Uh, but parts, documents, and files, by definition, are always going to be <coughs> version. Okay, so that'll map nicely, right? Uh, the version, yeah, that'll map nicely. It's a point, in point of fact. Um, that what I didn't show in my prior diagram, but I did reference, is the fact that uh, we're, we may check in new versions of that part before uh, several new versions before we create the next release of the part. Okay, the terminology sounds the same so far, doesn't it? And um, someone very nicely considered the fact that PLM systems have things called revisions, and they are not one and the same with versions. So thank you. That's good because it, because revisions have a whole different set of rules around. Uh, and, and as I demonstrated previously, revisions can have, when I say rules, I don't mean static rules, I mean dynamically evaluated rules, okay? So we do need to make that distinction and we very nicely have here. Okay, that's good. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, that's good. So far, so good. But there's more. Now the picture's not as nice. In a PLM system, what we are now calling a configuration in, uh, in this spec, it's very difficult to decide what, how, what that maps to in a PLM system. Are we talking about those bonds across the life cycle? Is that a configuration? Probably. But I'll tell you right now, it's not super clean, okay? Um, then we have a global config. No PLM system on the planet has ever heard of that, ever. None. Very few ALM products understand that. Okay, fair enough to define it. And the way it's written, it's not just, oh, IDM has global configuration management on the CLM platform, and that's what that means. No. I mean, if you read the definition of it, it is sufficiently not specific to the IDM global configuration concept that one could look at, you can read it as, this is a, a resource that defines a configuration across multiple tool domains. Ah, nice, we need that for ALM plus PLM, don't we? We need that. Uh, but nevertheless, if that's how you do choose to read it, it pretty well works with PLM because one of the participating configurations in it would come from the PLM system, yeah? However, if you choose to look at that the way IBM looks at it, you have a problem. Because the configuration in the IBM tool set's not truly global, is it? Uh, not to be picking on my former tool set, because I like their model. But that said, it's not truly global. It can't be. They're not doing hardware. Enough said. Baselines. Unknown to a PLM system. Sorry. Just not. Uh, branches. Not only no, but, well, hell no. <laughs> uh, strings. Okay, maybe, maybe. Okay, depends on if you read the spec. The way it's written, it doesn't really, again, describe IBM's idea of a string. IBM's idea of a string, and I've been around since the inception of that in a pre precursor tool called IBM Rational Clear Case, um, where string equals branch plus other behaviors and semantics, right? So uh, no, just no, right? For the same reason, no here. Variance. Sure, PLM systems define variants. Not anywhere like ALM systems define variants. And we just said why. Components, nope. Nice try. Do not exist in PLM systems. Uh, change sets, eh, maybe it's affected items. I don't know, I'm not sure how I would interpret that. I'm not sure how I would make my OSLC adapter respond to that for a PLM tool. Um, so it's, it's open to too much interpretation. All right, now I've got to look at this little nasty problem. How do most organizations deal with software um, in a hardware product? Well, they have a way. So let's pick automotive, and so I'll use the term ECU. Now that assembly 
um, is an ECU assembly, electronic control unit. There's 80 to 100 to 120 in most automobiles coming off the line today, yeah. Um, and then underneath that will be the kind of constituent parts that make up an ECU, right? And there's going to be a board and there's going to be electronic components going on the board, CPU and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, so good, that's how we, how we model that. Uh, now, um, what do we do with the software? Well, we create a dummy part. We create a ghost part. There's a lot of terms for it, okay? And we add it in there just like everything else and we hang it off the ECU in engineering, in the M and the bomb. This anyway. Um, remember that rev problem I was talking about? How fast does software change? How many releases? Well, the whole point of going to software and vehicles is so we can change it all the time, not have to bring the vehicle, right? Um, but so we're treating it as a part, but if we have the rule that every time it revs, this, 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 and all the way back up the line have to rev, that doesn't make any sense. Do so you know what they do in manufacturing? You ready? They, I told you the bombs aren't the same, right? This thing gets hung up here. And then they write a work instruction that says, oh, when you're doing this, when you're making this particular ECU, go up all the way, walk back up, go over here, get this software part, turn that into the problems in that device. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're not done yet. So now there's that there's that software thing again, right? So over in the SCM system, we have this structure, yeah. And so how do we get that into the bomb? Well, look, I'll tell you how we get the bomb. Ninety percent of organizations today do this or some form of it. We take the release bits. We take the, we build the software, we create the binaries, and we take those binaries, and we throw them over the fence at the PLM system, and we certainly hope that the person who catches them is knowledgeable enough to check those bits in against the right rev of the right part. Yeah? That never goes wrong. It works perfectly every time. <laughs> Do I sound, uh, you know? So um, what happens then? Do I have a record of, of anybody throwing any software over the fence? Um, Joe, the one who actually did that build and, ch and checked the build back in but didn't bother to name it anything meaningful whatsoever into the SCM tool, left the company and was hit by a bus on the way out the door. So no one on the PLM side has any idea where those bits came from. And the guy who knew where they came from is dead. Um, Traceability is gone. Now we have ways of doing this. We use naming conventions. We do all sorts of things, right? But from a formal and especially in a highly regulated industry perspective, no good. Bad dog, no biscuit, no good. <laughs> <laughs> what does this lead to? Wrong bits going to the factory floor. What does that lead to? Do I need to say any more? Okay. Um, what do we need? We need better traceability, don't we? Well, how about just some traceability? My gosh, even an Excel spreadsheet is better than what we have today. Um, actually, that's what most are doing, frankly. Yeah, no, it's not. Uh, yeah, exactly. So how are we going to make this? Well, here's the question. Can OSLC satisfy this need? Can it handle this traceability need? Well, you'll know I didn't answer it yet. Um, what happens when we cut a new software release? Okay, so um, we've got variant A at release 100, and, and now we've got variant B, A at release 101, and it is different, okay? And uh, we're gonna use OSLC to do this. The previous link in reality, right, really points to not just software part 123 variant A, it points to software part 123 variant A rev A. That's important, okay? Because we don't wanna lose that connection. Um, and uh, the new release, we are going to associate with the new rev of the software part. So the first thing that happens is an engineer in the PLM system goes and creates that new rev. Okay? Um, and we link the new release to the new rev. I'm not pointing out here the transfer of the files over to the PLM system and checking them in and connecting them back to the part I left that out of this diagram. Um, oh, but wait. We can't make that effective on the factory floor with the very next serial number because because of a thousand possible reasons. Okay, 
So the engineer writes an effectivity rule. The engineer sits down and figures out with what effective with what serial number, or God forbid, uh, uh, how many are familiar with dates effectivity? See, you see, serial number effectivity is quite advanced. Okay. Um, anyway, the point being, wrote an effectivity rule. But what is it? It's a rule. It's dynamically evaluated, at least as far as the engineering bomb is concerned. So, this is where the trouble begins. Because on the manufacturing floor, this, this update, that, that rule may not even come through. And if it does come through, a manufacturing engineer may choose to do something different with the bomb structure. And the software part might not be the right rep. Okay, so I'm not going into the detail here, but it's it happens there. But it's still as good as the X and the At least. Uh, it, you know, um, arguably the organizations that use the Excel spreadsheet to handle this are better off than the ones that are trying to do it through integration. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and while we're at it, what about all the rest here? Good heavens. We haven't, I've just talked about software. I haven't said a thing about requirements, system architecture, design models, FMEA, FTA, test, QA, QL, quality management systems, change management, manufacturing, service, or operations. Conclusions. All right. We have, uh, uh, we have very different things here. It prevents, or it, it presents some big challenges. There's a need, the need to bring these things together is, it's beyond critical. I can tell you, every time I visit a client, um, I hear the same story, right? It's funny, after they tell you the story and you play Dr. Phil with them and say, how's that working for you? They'll say, fine. You can't help, you can, yeah. OSLC has a chance of solving this problem, but that config management spec, in my opinion, needs some more work. It's got a lot of work behind it. I'm not taking anything away from it. It needs more. Otherwise, the two most important silos in the entire product development process are not going to be merged. It will be worth the effort. There it is. Okay, questions? Thank you.